let me let me start out by asking how many of you are extension developers? A few, okay. And how many of you have got your extensions listed on the JED? Okay. And final question, how many of you have actually posted an owner's response to a JED review that perhaps wasn't so positive? I know you do. <laughs> Well, what I'm going to talk about this morning is I'm going to give you a bit of history about the, uh, the Joomla extension directory. I'm going to talk about what a review is and then some of the consequences of making a bad or a wrong comment um, to that response. I'm going to touch a little bit on free extensions and paid extensions and the, the sort of discussion and debate that seems to go on all the time about um, you know, is it a free extension with paid support? Is it a paid extension? What should it be? And what are people's expectations? And I'll talk about responding to a review. And finally, if it all really goes wrong, um, reporting that review. So who am I? I'm Hugh Douglas Smith. Um, I'm the review manager for the Joomla extension directory. I've been doing that for about four years now. I'm also the marketing lead for JWC 17. So please come to Rome. You can get a 75 euro discount at the moment um, on a blind bird ticket. It's the first time the World Conference has come to Europe. It's in November this year. So do get there because it's gonna be a packed agenda and a really good conference. And I've also just taken on the, the lead. Um, some people within the Joomla community think that I'm actually pretty good at speaking English, um, which is just as well because it's the only language that I do speak. Um, so I'm now leading the, the team looking at the ENGB uh, language for Joomla 4. I've been using Joomla since the, the 1.5 beta. Um, I co-founded a web development company in the UK and I am totally oblivious to large mammals swimming up behind me and um, trying to scare me. I never see them, so I, it doesn't scare me. To give you some history on the, the JED, um, about three years ago, we launched the, the new version. Prior to that, um, all of the reviews that got submitted to all of the extensions went in and they were unpublished. And we had a team of five or six people that were constantly logging on every day, looking at the reviews, deciding whether or not it was a valid review and manually publishing them. It was an enormous amount of work. Typically, from a review being submitted to actually being published, there was about a two week backlog just because of the volume that had to be dealt with. And developers were saying, well, you know, somebody's reviewed my extension and I wanna get that out there. I want people to see it and it's not published. And why is it not published? And it was literally because there was such a volume of work and there were only half a dozen of us um, reviewing those and, and putting them up. So the new system, we said one of the, the key criteria here is it has to be auto publish. And that's what happens today. Um, unfortunately, that's brought in lots of other issues where We've had spam reviews, we've had fake reviews, and so now what we do is they get published, but then we have to filter through them and decide what to take out. Um, we have manual checking of those reviews, and we're automating the process as well, so there are filters that pick out potential problems, and we're training those filters the whole time, um, and then there might be a manual override afterwards to decide this should go in or that should go out. Um, so what is a review? Well, there's a lot of debate about this, but in my opinion, a review is the opinion of an extension user. Um, it's their opinion. You don't have to like it. I get so many tickets that come in that say, please remove this review, they're a liar. And I go and read the review and I'm thinking, it's not very positive, but they're not lying. They have had difficulty using this extension. 
their comments could be of value to other people that perhaps are going to select this extension. I can't see that it breaks any rules, therefore I'm not going to remove it. Um, as an extension developer, you don't necessarily have to agree with what your reviewer says. But what I hope you will have at the end of this presentation is an insight into perhaps there's another way of looking at it. Perhaps there's a way that I could turn this negative review into a positive and enhance my reputation on the JEB. What you absolutely can't do, and I try and tell developers this almost every week when I'm responding to tickets, you can't argue with the reviewer because doing so is just going to land you in a whole heap of issues that will trail along afterwards. So I'm going to, this is deliberately anonymized and serious apologies if you recognize this and it's your extension, um, but you're in the right presentation. Um, this is a live review from the JED. It's not a particularly positive review. I've redacted bits of it, so hopefully you don't identify who it is. Um, and the owner's reply starts by saying, hi, I really don't know how to answer this vicious review. And then goes on. Um, so you've got this small review and large volume of reply, basically taking the reviewer to task and arguing and saying, this is, this is all totally wrong. I'll give you another example. Um, again, quite a short review and the response that came back from the developer starts here, goes on and on and on and on and what that actually says to anyone that's thinking of using that extension that looks at the review tabs and scrolls through and says, oh help, if I start using this review and I ever get into trouble and I ever need assistance, this is scary, this is what might actually happen to me. And the net result is that because, not because of the negative review, but because of the way the review is being responded to by the developer, you're just not going to sell those extensions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can destroy your reputation. Thankfully, um, with the web and the social media and everything else, there are huge um, examples, fantastic examples of, of how this can be done. So coming from England, I'll use one of the classic English examples of what we call doing a ratner, and I will explain what that means um, to anyone that's not familiar with it. Um, I will also talk about preventing customer trust and destroying your reputation through that, I'll give you an example <coughs> of, of that. And the last way of really appearing condescending in how you go back to your customers and putting them off being customers from that perspective. So talking about the Ratner effect, um, who's heard of that? No? Gerald Ratner, back in the 80s, had um, a group of jewellery shops, very big in the UK, very big in the US, had over a thousand shops. It was a seriously big company. Um, and they sold very cheap jewellery. But it was all boxed up and packaged and it looked really nice and there was one on almost every high street. He was invited to a conference in the early 90s by the Institute of Directors because he was seen as one of these great businessmen that had been hugely successful. And he was asked, will you come to the conference? Will you mentor, give a presentation, a keynote to a thousand um, directors. So in April 91, at this conference, he said, and this is a quote, we do in our shops a cut glass de de decanter with six glasses and we put it on a silver tray and your butler could serve you drinks on it. And we do that whole thing for £4.95. 
And people say to me, how do you manage to do that? And he said, and I say, because it's total crap. <laughs> and there was a television camera at this conference and it was recorded. And this hit the news that Ratner had basically not only called his product crap, but by inference, anyone that bought it would accept crap. And the net result was that over the following month, 500 million pounds was knocked off his share price. Now this is back in the early 90s, when to knock half a billion off a share price was like it almost went out of business. Um, so the thing to take from this is, have respect for your customer. Don't do the Ratner. Killing your um, customer's trust is another way of badly responding to um, a poor review. And this example is an American example from a, uh, a crowdfunded um, startup, not from so long ago, it was last year, um, Garage Jet. And what this guy did, um, there's the founder, Dennis Grisak, he created an app and a little device that you put on your garage door and it would remind you via your phone if you hadn't closed your garage door when you drove to work and it would enable you to open it when you got back home. Somebody bought this device, decided it didn't work and posted a seriously negative review on his website and also posted those negative reviews on Amazon and all of his uh, supply chain. And Dennis decided to get even. But he didn't go and respond to the review. What he actually did was he went to his server, he worked out who the client was, and he just blocked them. And this guy now couldn't get into his own garage because Dennis had actually blocked him out of the app and effectively locked him out of his own home. And then it escalated. He managed to get himself a mention on the BBC News. He was covered across loads of websites. You know, I've been blocked out of my own home because I posted the negative review and suddenly nobody was buying his product. The final one I'm going to talk about, um, because they've actually been in the news very recently, is United Airlines. And everyone worldwide will have come across the rather unfortunate incident of a few weeks ago where the doctor was dragged off the, the plane even though he had a seat and a valid ticket. Um, but it's not the first time that United Airlines have done this. Just over 10 years ago, um, there was a, a Canadian singer that was traveling with the United and in a stopover, somebody on the other side of the plane commented, oh look, those baggage handlers outside are playing football with a guitar. And when he looked out of the window, it was his guitar. And when he got to his destination, um, his guitar was damaged. And he rang United and they said, actually, it's nothing to do with us because the ticket that you bought was a code share with another airline. You need to report it via them. And he thought, this is so much hassle. I'll wait until I get home. And two weeks later, when he got home, he then started the complaints procedure and United said, this has nothing to do with us now because you haven't reported this within two weeks. And he got into a year of um, trying to get $500, $600 of compensation for the repair of his guitar. And at the end of a year, United wrote to him and said, this has been escalating right the way up through our customer service channel. We've made a decision. We want nothing more to do with you. Please cease and desist, do not contact us again, do not write to us, you're blocked. So he rang them up and he spoke to their head of customer service and she called up the file and she said, look, you've already had this letter, we're not talking to you. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm ringing now after a year of effort to try and get $600 of compensation. Um, what I'm now telling you is I'm going back to what I do as my day job. I'm a singer, I write songs, I'm now going to write a song, I'm going to write three songs, 
a band united and how you break guitars. And I'm gonna make a video and I'm gonna put them on YouTube. And the girl said, well, best of luck with that one, pal. So he did, he wrote this song, it's brilliant. You can go onto YouTube, you can find it um, by searching for United Breaks Guitars. I recommend you do. Um, he had a, a friend with a video business, they made this video and um, it went onto YouTube. And he set himself a goal that over a 12 month period with three videos, three songs, he wanted a million views. He got them on the first video within three days. It went completely viral. He was called on to all of the major talk shows in America to tell his story and United stock price <coughs> dropped seven and a quarter percent. They then got the lawyers involved. The lawyers contacted him and said, take this video down, cease and desist. And his response was, best of luck with that one, pal. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, United don't seem to have really done, even though they now use this story within their own customer service training. But the incident of a few weeks ago with the doctor, um, where they managed a $1.4 billion drop in their market capitalization, um, they clearly haven't learned. Social media now is a channel that can destroy your reputation almost instantly. You can also build it. According to entrepreneur.com, the second most damaging way to destroy your reputation over social media is to disrespect someone. And that comes back to posting a response to a review. Um, as a, a developer, you're really proud of your code. Somebody doesn't like it, they post a negative review, and it's almost like a personal attack. But what I need you to do is just step back from that and respect that there are alternative views. Respect the way that you go back to um, your users. Coming from the UK, I'm not quite old enough to remember this, but 500 years ago, the UK and a lot of other countries at the time had ways of, of publicly shaming people that didn't conform, didn't fit into society. And we had the, the stocks outside every village. You'd get locked into the stocks. All of the villagers would pelt you with rotten vegetables. Um, that's gone now, but there are the equivalents of that within social media and online. Um, be really careful <coughs> how you can use it. If you disrespect customers publicly, <coughs> those prospects that are looking at what you're doing will probably never be customers. There is another approach to all of this, and I want to use this final example from Thomas Cook, which is one of the biggest travel companies in the UK. They supply literally millions of holidays to people every year. And in amongst all of that, things do go wrong and people do complain. And Thomas Cook make a real positive effort to deal with those negative reviews. And they actually publicize them on their website and say, these are some of the crazy reviews that we have had about our holidays. And they make a joke out of it. But they do it in a way that doesn't disrespect the, the person putting the complaint in. Um, but they do it to the amusement of, of everyone else. So I've got five examples here. You know, on my holiday to Goa in India, I was disgusted to find that almost every restaurant served curry and I don't like spicy food. Um, they should not allow topless sunbathing on the beach. It was very distracting for my husband because he just wanted to relax. <laughs> so, so they publish these on their website and it pulls people in. And it says, you know, Thomas Cook has a sense of humor. They have customers that really just need locking up. But um, rather than having that as a negative, you know, we went on holiday to Spain, we had a problem with the taxi drivers. They were all Spanish. <laughs> 
We booked an excursion to a water park. No one told us we had to bring our own swimsuits and towels. We just assumed it would be included. Thankfully, they didn't publish whatever went on after that. And the beach was too sandy. We had to clean it up when we returned to our room. It just, you can see how these comments get there. It's worth going to the website because there's, there's loads of them, but those were the, the top ones. And it's a great way of just softening the impact of a negative review <coughs> um, without disrespecting the, uh, the customer. So let's talk about a little bit about um, software and extensions on the, on the jet. A lot of developers put out free uh, extensions and then charge for support. Some of them they charge for a, a pro version. Um, what tends to go wrong in terms of the review is that the expectation level is set badly. Um, so I fully understand that as a software developer, you have to be paid at some point along the line. You know, you need to eat, food costs money, you need to live, accommodation costs money. If all of your time is spelt, spent writing software and it's all for free, how do you live? Um, so what you're up against is Joomla itself, which is what your extensions run on, is an open source project and it's free. So there's this natural expectation from potential customers that well, the, the CMS is free, and that's an infinitely bigger piece of software than this little tiny extension that I need. So why do I have to pay for that? Support for Joomla is free. Um, why do I have to pay for support for the extension? There's a balance there, and there's a balance that it's, I think, reasonably easy to achieve, but it's all about setting the right expectation and understanding that you can draw a line in the sand and say, you know, on this side of it, it's free, and on that side of it, it's paid for. Um, but there is a blurring there. So as an extension developer publishing on the JED, your market is Joomla. And the expectation of the, the users there is they want something for nothing. Joomla is free. It's open source software. That's where the starting point is. Joomla is used by millions upon millions of businesses. Um, and a lot of those businesses make their money out of Joomla. They don't do it as extension developers. Um, they actually do it as integrators. And they manage to sell an expectation from the outset that we might well be using this free software, um, but we charge. We produce a value add. We offer you design. We offer you the build services. We offer you the, um, the setup and the creation and everything else to build your website. So the end product that you have is your website. It just happens that it's been built on software that may or may not have been free. But what we're charging you for is the value add. And my company does this. Um, we don't produce free websites for people, we charge them. And there's never a problem with that. As an extension developer, you need to focus on your value add and explain to your clients, your potential customers, what it is that you're offering and why it should be a cost. And if you're upfront about that, um, you set an expectation where there then isn't this problem if you go through some of the reviews on the JED, um, a lot of the issues that come up with the, the negative responses are, this software was free and I have to pay for support. 